Today we're going to look at the other side of humility. The other, other in quotations. As I was doing it this week, I felt like uh, Alex Trebek, you know, he'll give you the things and he'll say something in quotations. So it's about the other. So it's the other side of humility. And here's the big idea for the, for the day, for the week. There's no real life without community. There is no real community without humility and self-denial. It's hear about the minister who said he had a wonderful sermon on humility, but he was waiting for a large crowd before preaching it. There are times that I'll go through the week and I'll be preparing and, and I'll think I've got the greatest message that I've ever put together. And I'll come in here and there'll be 15 of you sitting out here and I'm like, wow, I'm going to waste this on them. <laughs> That's the wrong attitude. If one person shows up, guess what? We got the word of God. So it's good to see you this morning. It's a dreary day, but you know, we ought to be getting used to it by now, shouldn't we? But you know what? Even when it's dreary, we can give thanks and praise, right? We surely can. Turn to Philippians chapter 2. We're going to read through our passage, and then we'll go back and break it down just a little bit. Remember, Paul is talking, writing a letter to the church at Philippi. And remember, he's writing from jail. And remember, he's writing to encourage them, not to hammer them. This is, this is the one letter that he writes where he's just trying to be an encouragement because he loves the church at Philippi. Not that he doesn't love all the other churches, but the church at Philippi has been especially good to him. They've sent him money. They've sent him prayers. I sent up prayers for him while he was in prison. They've helped him out tremendously, and we'll, we'll find out more about that as we get on into the, into the letter. But here's what I want you to understand as we're reading through this letter, and we're breaking it up because we can't do the whole book in one setting. This is a letter. And I don't care if your Bible has got where you go down four or five verses, then it's got a new heading, and then we start some new verses, and it's got a new heading. And it makes it look like there's a bunch of different things that the writers of these letters are trying to say to us so we can break it at any point. But it's a letter. It's just a letter. Think about letters you write. Do you ever repeat your... Well, does anybody ever write a letter anymore? Remember back the day we wrote letters. Did you ever repeat yourself in a letter? Did you ever reemphasize something in a letter, trying to make a point across? Did you ever write a letter and get to the end and go back and read it and say, I don't know why I said all that. Well, Paul will reemphasize every now and then some things that he's already said, but it's a letter. It's not a bunch of different letters. It's not a bunch of... It's not written so we pastors can have a bunch of different sermon topics. And if we're not careful, that's how we treat the Word of God. But let's read it together, and then we'll come back and we'll break it down just a little bit. Philippians chapter 2, verse 1. Paul has just told them in, in, in chapter 1, if you will, he's told them you'll have conflict and you'll suffer as I have suffered. You know, if you think about it, that's not really a good way to build a church. You come in here on Sunday morning and I say, oh, by the way, this week you're going to suffer. And it's like, oh, let's go to a church that's not going to suffer. So Paul is telling them, you will have conflict and, you, and you'll suffer as I have suffered. So verse 1, and he says, so. Maybe your version says, therefore. Anytime you see the word so, starting a verse, or you see the word therefore, it's in connection to something that's already been said. So since you will have conflict and suffer as I have, so if there is any encouragement in Christ... Any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Verse 3, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. But he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name, 
that is above every name. So that, at, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Father, that you've given us your word so that we can not just read it, but Lord, we can learn from it and we can apply it to our lives so that we can live a life that's pleasing to you first and foremost, Lord. I pray that that's our desire. I pray, Lord, as we read your word, we don't just take it as uh, uh, some, some old letters written way back when and, and they don't apply to us, but Lord, we, we know in our heart and your spirit is telling us in our, in our heart that we have something here from you that applies today just like it did yesterday and it will apply tomorrow so i pray father that your spirit would move in our midst i pray lord that we would allow your spirit to speak to our hearts that we would open up our ears and our minds to hear what your spirit would have to say to us lord and i pray father that we would learn something from your word that will help us to go out and to live a life pleasing to you a life that is a reflection of your love a life that has power a life that has whatever it is you want us to have to make a difference in this world. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for the sacrifice. Thank you for your spirit. Thank you for all things in Jesus' name. Everybody said? Amen. 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 Back to Philippians chapter 2, verse 1. So since you will have conflict and you will suffer, suffer as I have, Paul says, so if there is any encouragement in Christ, by the way, these are rhetorical statements, Okay, we, we do rhetorical statements, we do rhetorical questions oftentimes to get you to think. You've heard me say this before, you walk into the room and there's color crayon marks all over the wall. You look at your child and you ask a ridiculous rhetorical question. Did you do that? And the only people that's been in that house is you and that child. I don't know who did it. The dog did it. Uh, we don't have a dog. I do. That's right. Anyway. So rhetorical questions, they don't need an answer. They just need us to think. Rhetorical statements are there for us to think. Paul says, so if there is any encouragement in Christ, and by the way, there's a lot of encouragement in Christ. Any comfort from love. I don't know about you, but when I feel loved from somebody and I feel God's love, I feel comfort. Any participation in the Spirit, I can walk in the Spirit. I can allow the Spirit to have control of me. I can have total participation in the Spirit. Any affection and sympathy. He says, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. We talked about this a little bit a week before last, I believe it was. And I want us to read Philippians chapter 1 verse 27 again, because what Paul is doing here is he's rep repeating from an earlier statement. And it's really, you know, if you're reading the letter as one letter, it, it was just a few seconds ago that he said this to them. So it must be important. Paul loved the Philippian church. And he wanted that church to succeed. He wanted that church to be a witness. He wanted that church to be a light. So Paul is writing to them and say, says to them, you're going to have hard times. You're going to have struggles. And listen to me, we've been spoiled in this nation as, as a church. It's going to change. It may not change in my days, but I believe before your children get my age, if, if the Lord tarries that long, things are going to change. And we may need to be teaching them that, honey, one of these days life could change in this country and it may not be as easy to be a Christian. I really believe sometimes it's too easy to claim the name of Christ in this country. So Paul is saying, since things are going to change, I need you guys to be on the same page. I need you to be of one mind. Philippians chapter 1, verse 27, he said this, Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ. Our manner of life should be worthy. You call yourself a Christian. I call myself a Christian. My manner of life should be worthy of that gospel. 
So that whether I come, he says, whether I come and see you or I'm absent, whether I'm there with you or I'm just writing you letters, that I may hear of you that you're standing firm in one spirit, with one mind striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. Paul's appealing to the Philippians based on their shared experience in Christ to have the same mind and love. It wasn't just for them, it's for us today too. The church is probably more divided today than it's ever been. I don't know, I didn't live back then. But I know there wasn't a church on every corner back those days. I know there wasn't 47 different denominations, 57 varieties of Baptists. They used to call Baptists the Heinz 57. 57 varieties. And as a rule, none of the 57 got along. And what's happened today is churches are in competition, and we shouldn't be. We should have one thing in mind. We should be of the same mind, and that's sharing Jesus and his love and his forgiveness and his power. Verse 3, so as a foundation for this unity that Paul's talking about, Paul calls them to something that we in America uh, most don't get. Paul calls them to humility. Humility is not really taught in this country much anymore, is it? Some of you older hats, you remember back in the days where there seemed to be more humility. I don't know. I didn't live way back then. I lived back then, but not way back then. But humility is not something that's encouraged in our society. You watch sporting events, and it seems like basketball players are the worst. They're always telling you how humble they are. I'm a humble person. <laughs> no, you're not. <laughs> not if you have to tell me. You know, show me. Don't tell me. Don't go around telling people how humble you are. You know what I'm saying? I'm going to look at you and laugh. In love, of course. Because I'm humble and I wouldn't want to hurt your feelings. <laughs> Chapter 2, verse 3, Paul says this, as a foundation for unity. I'm calling you to humility. He says, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit. There's nothing wrong with ambition. We should have ambition, right? We should be ambitious in our life. But if it's a selfish ambition, I want to get to the top. I want to have more. I want to look the best. I want everybody to look at me. I want everybody to bow to me. I want everybody to want what I've got. Well, that's okay if you're wanting them to want Jesus. Anything else, you've got to be careful that you don't have some selfish ambition and conceit. And Paul is saying to the church, don't do that because it'll get your focus off of what's real. It'll get your focus off of what's important. He says, but in humility, count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Now, Paul is saying right there, you have a right to look out for your own interests, right? Right? He says, let each of you look not only to his own interests. He's not saying don't look to your own interests, because you've got to take care of your own interests. You have responsibilities, right? 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 but also to the interests of others. Just think about how much nicer the world would be if there were no prideful or arrogant people. Are you a prideful person? Are you arrogant? Do you think that you deserve people to look up to you? Paul would be telling you that's the wrong attitude. He says, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. If there were no prideful and arrogant people, we'd be in such a better, nicer world. If everyone were concerned with others instead of themselves. If I consider you above me and you consider me above you, then a marvelous thing happens. We have a community where everyone is looked up to and no one is looked down on. If I'm looking up to you, and you're looking up to me, because I consider you more important than I consider myself. 
Now, if I'm doing it to look super spiritual, God knows, right? He knows your heart. He knows your motives. You've heard me say this before. Humility is not stepping, reaching down, bending down to someone and then getting back up and going your merry little way. Humility is not going on a missions trip for a few days or, God forbid, a whole week. Getting down on their level to rub their heads, to have photo ops. Nothing wrong with pictures. We're going to have pictures because you need to know what's going on, and I'm not talking about our people. I'm just talking about the whole thing as a, the thing as a whole. And we take some things to other people, and then we get up and we just walk away and we come back to our elevated or our puffed up lifestyle. That's not true humility, is it? I was in my chair this morning, and it was feeling good. And I came up with this thought. It's original to me. I probably read it somewhere. I don't think I have a, uh, an original thought in my brain. But, it, but I was sitting there, and as I was going through my message, I thought about this, and, and I said to myself, humility is a lifestyle, not something you occasionally do to feel good about yourself right? If we're not careful, we go on mission trips so, it, so, so we'll feel good. If we're not careful, we come to church once a week so that we can mark that off and we feel good about ourselves. If we're not careful, every now and then we'll stick a $5 bill out the window because your car just happens to have stopped. Right. Isn't that awkward? Your car at the intersection stops right where the person's holding the sign. And you've got this going on in your mind. I know I'm a Christian. But if I just ignore them, they'll go away. No, they won't. And then you start playing games with yourself and you start talking about how they just need to get out and get a job. And 99% of them, that is correct. They just need to get a job. Try this someday. Offer them a job. But we sit there and many times we don't want to look because we just don't want to have to participate. But then every now and then, you may look up in your mirror and your pastor's behind you. You're sitting at the intersection. Somebody's sitting there and go, hungry, God bless. I like how they always bless you. And you look in the mirror and they're like, oh, there's Mickey behind me. Oh, you roll the window down and you stick out a dollar or a five or something. I've never seen that, but I'd love to see that. I'm going to start honking and flashing my lights. I know people take advantage, but that's not for us always to decide whether it's happening or not. And humility says, you know, it's not about getting down to where they are. It's about doing what you can to lift them up. True humility lifts up. It doesn't just get down and play in the dirt for a while and then go back to our vaunted lifestyle. I was reading also this week, and I understand. Any of you ever been in the Marines? Anybody? Mar Marines? You know, from the halls of Montezuma, as Gomer used to say, to the shores of Tripoli. Okay, so those of you here in the Navy, the Army, and the Air Force, and the Coast Guard, you're probably going to groan when I say this, but... <laughs> I read this week, and I, I, I read two or three things, because sometimes you can read things, and you say it as truth, and you find out you were wrong because it was just on Google. But I understand that marine leaders are expected to eat last because the true price of leadership is the willingness to place the needs of others above your own. Okay, I just read about marines. I hope that. But you know what? It should be that way with all believers, Right? Allowing others to be put first. And remember what I said a while ago. If you place others ahead of yourself, and then others place you ahead of yourself, we're just going to be beating each other up, just trying to be the one to be the nicer one. But be careful you don't get all puffed up about it. So Paul's talking about this humility thing. And so as a foundation for humility... 
Paul points them to the example of Jesus. The ultimate example in humility, right? Right? Verse 5 says, Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. Your version may say, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Have a mindset that Jesus had. He's our foundation for humility. He's our example. So when Paul in 1 Corinthians 11, 1, as we talked about a few weeks ago, says, follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. Again, it's not follow me, follow my example, because I'm following Jesus' example. And so he's telling us in verse 5 that we should have this mind that Jesus had. And as a believer, you can. Verse 6, who thought... Who, excuse me, who though he was in the form of God did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. What is that talking about? We know that God is spirit. The Bible teaches us that God is spirit, right? And those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. And there was a time when Jesus, if I understand it correctly, was spirit. And the Bible says though he was in the form of God, he did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. That word grasped in the Greek means to be clung to or hung on to. In other words, Jesus did not cling to the privileges of his deity. You see, when he left heaven, when he left the splendor of heaven, the Father and he and the Spirit, Holy Spirit, all had a purpose that Jesus would come to earth and take on the form of man, right? Verse 7 says, he emptied himself. And there's a theory out there, it's called the kenosis theory, that says, and it's, it's also what we talked about when we were in 1 John. The, Gnostics, the Gnosticism teaching was that, that Jesus was just a man until the Spirit of God came upon him, right? Remember that? We talked about that. So this kenosis theory says that when Jesus left heaven, he did away with all of his deity. He was just a man. That's a crock. Paul says he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant being born in the likeness of man. That word taking there. It's the ancient Greek word, L-A-B-O-N. It does not apply an exchange. It's not saying that Jesus exchanged his deity for humanity. The word means an addition. In addition to his deity, Jesus became fully human. Hence, fully God, fully man, right? And I think it's very important that it was done that way. Because as Jesus came, he left the splendor of heaven, he walked the earth. God knows how you feel. Right? Right? I don't know if that does anything for you, but it does a whole lot for me. While Jesus did have the outward form of humanity when he came to earth, the outward form reflected his true humanity, which was added to his deity. And verse 8 says, And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Jesus is the greatest servant of all time. And Jesus even made this comment, I didn't come to be served while on this earth, but to serve and to give my life as a ransom for many. He had a purpose for coming. And I'm thankful he took on the form of human because he knows how I feel. So Jesus did not cease to be God during, during his earthly ministry, but there's some things we need to understand. He did set aside his heavenly glory of a face-to-face -face relationship with the Father. He also set aside his independent authority during his earthly ministry, Christ completely submitted himself to the will of the Father. Remember? In the garden, 
Is there another way to do this? Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Jesus said, I didn't, everything that I speak, I speak because that's what the Father is speaking. Everything I do, I do because that's what the Father wants me to do. So Jesus was submitted, he submitted himself to the will of the Father. But that does not mean that he lost his deity. That does not mean that he lost his godness, if you will. And as we look in these verses, Paul does not give us all that is in the mind of Christ. He selects those qualities of our Lord which fit the needs of the Philippians at that moment. And that's humility. He wanted that church to understand what it was to have humility. God wants us to understand what it means to be humble. God wants us to follow the example of Jesus so that other people can follow our example. We're going to keep hitting on that. You're going to hear that several times throughout the book of Philippians. Paul's talking about humility. And I'm going to quickly go through some things. I think it's on your um, events page. It's not up here. Jesus was humble in that he took the form of a man. He could have took the form of a glorious angel or whatever, but he humbled himself and took the form of a man. He was humble in that he was born into an obscure, oppressed place. He was born into Bethlehem. There's nothing special in Bethlehem. Micah told us that. Back in Micah chapter 1, verse 2 or 2, verse 1, or somewhere back in Micah. He was humble in that he was born into poverty among a despised people. You see, the religious ones thought that Jesus should have come as this warring king. He was humble in that he was born as a child instead of appearing as a man. The father could have said, son, I want you to be full grown. Go down there and do your thing. But that's not the way it worked. He was humble in submitting to the obedience of a child in a household. He had earthly parents. He was humble in learning and practicing a trade. He was a carpenter by trade. That's not a real flamboyant trade, is it? If you're a carpenter, I, I, <laughs> what I'm saying is that doesn't get you accolades as a, as a rule. People are not going to bow down to you because you're a carpenter. Even though you can go build their beautiful home, right? You can make them look good. As a bricklayer, I used to make people look good all the time. You say, that sounds prideful. Huh, it did, didn't it? But I was a good bricklayer. He was humble in the long wait until he launched out into public ministry. How long did he was he on this earth before he started his ministry? Do you know? Thirty years. That seems like a long time to wait, doesn't it? That tells me my not, my God's not in a hurry. The Bible, in fact, says that God is patient. Not as we count patient, because we don't really know what that is. God is long-suffering. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all come to repentance. Aren't you thankful he waited on you? Aren't you? Boy, I am. He was humble in the companions and the disciples he chose. He chose fishermen. He chose tax collectors. He chose zealots, these people who just wanted to go out and fight somebody. He chose liars. He chose weenies, sissies, whatever. Cowards, I guess is a better word. He was humble in the audience he appealed to and the way he taught. Masses, sitting on heels, sitting around the water. He was humble in the temptations he allowed and endured. The Bible says that he, you know, was tempted in every area as we are, yet without, yet without sin. Satan took him out and had a heyday with him. 
And for 40 days, he was in the wilderness being tempted of Satan so that he could know what we go through. I mean, he's God, you would think he would know, and I'm sure he does and did, but aren't you thankful that he felt what you feel sometimes? Aren't you? I am. Because I, gotta, I have a God, I have a Savior who knows what I go through. He was humbled to his total obedience to his heavenly Father. He was humble in weakness. He was humble in his hunger and his thirst and in the tiredness that he endured. He was God who came to earth in the form of man and allowed himself to be hungry, to be tired, to be thirsty, to suffer pain. Aren't you thankful? He was humble in his submission to the Holy Spirit. He was humble in choosing and submitting to the death on the cross, the worst death known to mankind. He was humble in the agony of his death. He was humble in the shame, the mocking, and the public humiliation of his death. Aren't you thankful? Now, Jesus came to be the Savior of the world. But according to Paul, he also came to give us an example on how to live. An example on how to be humble. I'm going to lovingly tell you that everything you've got and everything that you're striving for from a worldly realm, God is not impressed with. You know, in and of ourselves, we can't impress God, right? We we, we can't. And many people in churches all throughout America today have their mind on one thing, and that's more, more, more. Giving your children what you never had. Making sure that they're taken care of for the rest of their life. You're supposed to take care of your kids, right? I think Scripture teaches us to prepare. But if that's our motivation, if that's our focus, if that's all we care about, and we care so much about that, we will not stoop down to help somebody in need. We're sinning against God. If we won't give to help somebody that we know has a need and needs our help, it's going to make some people mad. In America today, many people take better care of their pets than they do a human being in need. And I think Romans chapter 1 talks a little bit about that. Worshiping the creation more than the creator. And when society starts falling apart, those are the things that we do. Listen to me. People are more, is more, are more important than your pets. People are more important than your job. People are more important than your status at, at your workplace. And Jesus showed us that, and he gave us an example to follow. Why are we not, as a whole, following it? And that's what Paul is saying to the church at Philippi. This is what you need to be doing. Because Jesus gave you the ultimate example. And if you don't stick together, if you start splintering off, then the enemy is going to have a heyday with you. And Christ is not going to be exalted. And that should be our number one focus, to exalt our Lord and our Savior. When we go to Haiti and we're really praying hard about what we can do to help that orphanage over there, it's just just that much compared to everything else going on in the world. But we can do our part, can't we? Can't we? And I don't want it to ever be just, uh, let's get some people together and go on a missions trip so we can feel good. No. No. So that we can go and we can be humble and we can show the love of Jesus. And we can go over there and and I think this is Greg's heart. I'm pretty sure it is. And, 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 And as we met the other day with some leaders and stuff, it was this. We don't want to just go over there with handouts. We want to go over there and teach them. We don't want to just give them fish and feed them for a day. We want to teach them how to fish and feed them for a lifetime. I didn't write that. That's not original. 
for those of you who thought I sounded real smart. Or, yeah. But you know, I want you to think about it. And this, is, I, I, this was not in my notes, and Greg didn't threaten me and make me say this. That orphanage needs $125 a month to get the water, clean water that they need. Uh, Alice was telling me yesterday that our water bill, water bill, 40 something dollars. You say, well, I wish you had mine. No, I, well, I'm glad you got yours. Do you know how much our consumption was for the month? Four dollars and something. I should be more excited to send some money to Haiti to help them have water than to, I want to pay my bills because we need to. That irked me when you told me that. I almost ran the car off the road. <laughs> I got to hurry. Verse, verse 9. Because of what Jesus did. Because he left heaven. Because he's God in the flesh. Because he died on the cross. Because he's the savior of the world. Verse 9, therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name. I had a, this, it's not a special revelation outside of the Bible, it's just something that nobody's ever taught me. And I should know this. We should know this. You see, Paul, no doubt, he doesn't have any doubt who the Lord is is. He knows that he's not the Caesar whom he will stand trial before someday. He knows that Caesar may be, high, be a high name, but it's not the name above all names, right? Trump is not the name above all names. Putin is not the name above all names. AOC, don't even get me started. but I need to be showing AOC love, don't I? I don't need to be bad-mouthing bad her as a person. I can bad-mouth her policies all I want to. Just what I do in her love. But Paul knew that name that is above every name. He says, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. Something powerful about that name, isn't there? And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now I want to show you something. And I hope this punches you in the face just like it did me. Or maybe punches you in the heart. Verse 9, Paul says, God has highly exalted Jesus, God the Father, and bestowed on him the name that is above every name. When you go back to the Old Testament and you look at the names for God, what is the name above every name? It's Yahweh. Moses says, who do I tell him sent me? And God says, I am. And I am that I am. And I am is Yahweh. Now I want you to look at this. I want you to catch this. Maybe brand new to some of you. He said, so that every tongue confesses that Jesus Christ is Lord. And we just read through that sometime. Paul says in Romans 10, he says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God's raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. The word Lord in the New Testament is the Greek word it's either K-U-R-I-O-S, Kyrios, or K-Y-R-I-O-S, Kyrios. And it's an interpretation of an Old Testament Hebrew word. You know what that Old Testament Hebrew word is? Yahweh. 
So what Paul is saying, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name. So that the name of Jesus, every knee should bow, that's important, in heaven and on earth and under earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, that Jesus Christ is Kyrios, that Jesus Christ is Yahweh. And I know that can be confusing. I thought God is Yahweh, yeah. But if we're not careful, we look at God and we don't realize we're talking about the Godhead, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. And the name of the Godhead, the name of the Father, the name of the Son is Yahweh. Now, I'm going to get some kickback on that, and I look forward to it. But I want us to understand, because we zip through the Scripture, and sometimes we don't really realize what we're reading. Turn to Isaiah chapter 45 quickly, 700 years before the birth of Christ. And look what God, look what Yahweh said. He said, turn to me and be saved, all the ends of the earth, for I am God and there is no other. There is no other God. There's the Father, there's the Son, there's the Spirit, the Godhead. Three in one, we say. There is no other God. He says, by myself I have sworn, from my mouth has gone out in righteousness, a word that shall not return. In other words, it's a word that just keeps going. And he says, to me, every knee shall bow. And every tongue shall swear allegiance. Every tongue shall confess. And then I go back and I read it again. God has highly exalted Jesus and bestowed on him the name that is above every name. So that's the name of Jesus. Every knee should bow. Why? Because we know who Jesus is. Every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Jesus Christ is Kyrios. Jesus Christ is Yahweh to the glory of God the Father. I hope that sinks in a little bit. You see, the combination of tongues confessing and knees bowing gives evidence that the idea is a complete submission to Jesus, both in word and in action. And it's one that's required of all. You see, those who denounce, those who say, I don't believe, those who curse him, one day are going to stand before God. And the Bible says, every knee is going to bow and every tongue will confess that he's Lord. The sad part about that is many of them, it's going to be too late for them. And they'll be ushered into a place of eternal torment, a place called hell, because they never trusted, they never accepted, they never acknowledged that name, which is above all names. The one who died for you and for me. The one who loved us so much, he was willing to humble himself. The father was willing to allow his son to come down and take the sin upon his back for you and for me so that we could be forgiven. You see, Jesus Christ, he's the Son of God and King of Heaven. He had the right, he has the right, he had the right to be honored, praised, and worshipped. Yet to be our Savior, he laid all of his privileges aside and became a lowly, humble servant. And we often hear people talk of living as Jesus lived and while he truly is the model for us to follow, many who speak of following him are unwilling to give up their rights and reflect his humility. You know, we'll never be like Jesus unless we're humble and we're lowly. Let's bow our heads. Here's my question to you. Is there some pride you need to give up? And you've heard me say this before. There's a difference in taking pride in your work because if I'm truly taking pride in my work and I'm doing it God's way, I'm doing it to point to Him. You need to be honoring God with your work. You need to be honoring God with your play. You need to realize when you're in another state, God is there too. Even when you're in Illinois, God's there. 
It's like sometimes we go off to another place and we think I can go live and be and do whatever I want to do. But when I come back to Paducah where everybody knows me or I come back to church where everybody knows me, I've got to be something different. God wants his children to live a life of humility. He wants his children to be a reflection of Jesus. He wants his children to walk in the spirit so that we don't fulfill the lust of the flesh. And the lust of the flesh says, I want more, more, more. I want to be seen. I want people to look up to me. I've worked hard for what I've got. I've worked hard for where I am. So what about you? What do you need to turn loose? How about if you go in tomorrow into your job and say, I'm, I'm going to do it as unto the Lord. We talked about this a few weeks ago. What if you walked into your job and said, I want to reflect Jesus? What if you walk into school and say, I want to reflect Jesus? What if you walked into the gym and said, I want to reflect Jesus? Things would change. Father, thank you for your word. And I pray, Lord, that you would speak to our hearts and help us to realize how much you love us that you would help us realize what you've done for us in sending your son, Jesus. That you would help us to desire to please you with everything that we have and everything that we do. And Lord, that we would get our focus off of, of, of stuff to be seen. And Lord, I believe it's okay to have stuff. But Lord, help me to honor you with the stuff that I do have. And Lord, help me to not desire so much stuff that I can't help somebody else in need. And Lord, help us as a church to reach out and to make a difference. And Father, I pray for the one here today that doesn't know you in a personal way through your son, Jesus. That Lord, before this day, before this morning is even up, Lord, that they can confess with their mouth that Jesus is Lord, Jesus is God, Jesus is Yahweh. And and believe in their heart that he was raised from the dead. Then you say in your word, that's what brings salvation. Help that person that needs you, Lord, and help us. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen.